they said, well, because you were on travel orders, you know, you get per diem, except it was a government provided quarters and government provided meals. So they gave us $2 a day for incidentals. <laughs> Like, like, like we're going to be able to buy a newspaper somewhere. How are we doing on time? Today is a retired colonel of the U.S. Air Force who holds a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics and a Master of Science in Systems Management. He is a veteran of four space flights, logging in a total of 40 days and 17 hours in space, and he has 2016's Astronaut Hall of Fame inductee. So please welcome Colonel Brian Duffy. Oh, wow. Who knows? It might be one of them. <laughs> someone's gonna, someone's gonna do it. So, so well, I'd like to start now with this picture here because this view is um, was last seen by a human being in 1972. And that was when the Apollo 17 folks were coming back from the moon, the last Apollo mission. But Gene Cernan and his crew took, took that picture there, and. And in 1972 was a long time before high definition was invented. So when I look at the Mars generation here, I have a request to them that when they're coming back from Mars <laughs> and they see this view here, take a good high def picture for me so that I can use it in my presentation. <laughs> uh, what do you see here? Boats. Yeah, boats is what I usually get. <laughs> Yeah, and then, and then the space shuttle on, on the launch pad in the background there. This, this photo was taken in 1992 on the day before I was going to launch on my first mission. So that's the space shuttle Atlantis in the background that you see there. But in 1992, the United States was celebrating the 500th anniversary of Columbus having discovered the new world. And so the day before we're launching these three replica ships from Columbus's fleet with sailing, sailing pad, the launch pad. So when, when I look at that picture, what I see is 500 years of transportation technology development. Because 500 years before, if you were gonna cross the Atlantic Ocean, you got in one of these really modern ships. <laughs> <laughs> that, was the best, that was the technology of the day, the best it has. Um, and it would take you two months to cross the ocean. We fast forward 500 years, the day after this picture was taken, I got in another kind of a ship, a spaceship, and that you see in the background there. And I crossed the Atlantic Ocean in under 10 minutes. <laughs> so how do you think we'll be traveling 500 years from now? Blink of an eye. Yeah, I have no idea, it might be, you know, one of these youngsters invents a new technology that changes the way humans travel around the world. Who knows? I, I would just say that it's, uh, I feel comfortable saying, even though I don't know how it's going to be, it's not the way we're doing it today. But we, people will be traveling differently. So I, I tell you what, I'll make you a deal. I'll meet you back here in 500 years. <laughs> and, and, we, and we can talk about what happened. <laughs> Sometimes we get asked, you know, how do you get to be an astronaut? And I'd like to use this as my fourth crew, my last mission. Um, 
use this as an example to introduce them to you. And um, we were pretty representative of the people that are in the office then and now. Uh, so I'll start in the top left, and turns out he was here yesterday, Dr. Leroy Chow. Uh -huh. And uh, Leroy, has, he's from San Francisco. Uh -huh. He has an undergrad and a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of California system. Um, next to Spain, but he was raised in Southern California, and he's a graduate of the, of the United States Naval Academy, and has a master's degree from the Naval Postgraduate School, and he was a Navy test pilot. In the center is Bill MacArthur from North Carolina, and Bill has a, uh, he graduated from West Point, and has a master's degree from Georgia Tech University, and Bill was an Army helicopter test pilot. Second from the right is my nominee for the world's smartest man, <laughs> Dr. Jeff Weissoff, or Bulldog as I nicknamed him because uh, I could give him any task to do as the, as the mission commander, I just kind of decided who does what. And I could, I could give him any task to do, it didn't matter if it was a big one or a small one, he wouldn't let go of it until it was done, so he was my bulldog. <laughs> uh, he's from West, uh, um, he's from um, Virginia Beach, Virginia, he majored in physics at the University of Virginia, and he has a PhD in laser physics from Stanford University. So those first four folks I just introduced, those were my spacewalkers okay. on the team. Our mission was an international space station assembly mission. We were pretty early in the sequence, and uh, we, we carried uh, two pieces of the space station. Up. And so I flew the rendezvous and the docking with the space, what was there at the time. Koichi Wakata, who I'm introduced right now, on the far right there wearing a flag in Japan. Uh, Dr. Koichi Wakata, who uh, has an undergrad and a PhD in aeronautical engineering from the Japanese university system. But Koichi was my robotic farm operator on there. So I flew the rendezvous and the docking. Koichi used the robotic arm to put the pieces in place, pick them up out of the payload bay and put them in place. Uh, and then on four consecutive days, the spacewalkers went out in, in teams of two, alternating teams of two, and they hooked up all of the electrical connections and the fluid lines and everything, so the pieces that we just uh, had put in place would work. So, my pilot on the mission, and my only rookie, is Colonel Pam Melroy. Pam's from Rochester, New York. She went to Wellesley College outside of Boston has a master's degree from MIT, and Pam was uh, an Air Force pilot, an Air Force test pilot, an Air Force combat pilot. <gasps> an amazing lady. Uh, and being the rookie though, you know, this was her dream as a child, was to become an astronaut. So uh, when she came to work every day, she brought all the energy and all the enthusiasm. Uh, not that the rest of us were old and crusty or anything. <laughs> <laughs> especially excited so so we trained together for this mission for two and a half years so a long time you get to know people really well mm -hmm. and, and when you're when you're in close quarters uh, and together for two and a half years and we really liked each other we had a good time uh, as a crew we did things outside of work together we go to you know go to restaurants together we go to movies together we have we have the same sense of humor so so while this is the NASA, official NASA crew photo for SPS-92, <laughs> <laughs> this, this is more what we were really like. <laughs> because if you can't have fun when you're training for a space flight, you're not doing it right. Mm -hmm. And we had, we had a lot of fun doing that. But at the end of the two and a half years, however, uh, it was time for us to, to go to work. And, here we are down at the Kennedy Space Center in a quarantine facility. We call it the crew, the crew quarters down there. Um, having breakfast on um, lunch day, and then after uh, after the photo ops and everything, they, they parade the photographers through. But, you know, we just sit there and smile. <laughs> but then it's a short walk down the hallway to get in our launch and entry suits, a pressure suit that we wear during the launch and during for entry there. Um, because those are the two most dynamic phases of the flight, uh, you know, if there's going to be a problem, it's most likely going to happen during either the launch or, or the entry. 
there. So here you can see checking out the communication system, making sure it's gonna work, checking the seals on the helmet and the gloves, making sure there aren't any leaks in the suit. If you're gonna have a problem, you wanna find it before you get out on the pad, because it's hard to fix things out there. Uh, and then here we are, about three and a half hours before launch, getting ready to, uh, to head out to, before the launch. And if you look at the, the smart, the faces of what we remember there, you don't see them smiling, we're happy to be there, we're getting ready to go do what we've been training for. Um, so we're, there are a couple reasons that there's nobody, you know, nobody's worried. Number one is in the two and a half years that we trained, we knew that anything that was gonna go wrong, that we could do anything about, we were prepared for it. And, and the second reason is because in the shuttle program, uh, any one of a million things would stop you from launching. In fact, in my lifetime, I've gone to bed 10 different nights expecting to launch the next day, and it's only happened four times. So, <laughs> so, so six times I didn't go for one reason or another. So the reason that you don't see that there's any worry on anybody's face is because we really didn't think we were going anywhere. <laughs> but we did. Wow. So the, um, you know, the challenge that you have to get anything in a orbit is it has to get going really fast. In fact, this the space shuttle vehicle, the whole vehicle on the pad, weighed about five million pounds, the size of a seventeen-story building, and we have to get it going seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour in eight and a half minutes. Wow. And, and the way we did, did that was initially those two big solid rocket boosters, and they're called solids because the propellant inside is the consistency of a, it's a solid, it's about the consistency of a pencil eraser there. And it has enough propellant in it to burn for just over two minutes, and together that produced about six million pounds of thrust. So we're, we weigh five million on the pad, we got six million just off the boosters. So, so you are going to go somewhere when they like. <laughs> Might not know where. <laughs> you, are, you are going somewhere. Um, so at the end of that two minutes, we're about 25 miles high, about 25 miles downrange, going about four times the speed of sound. Uh, and we're just getting started because we have to get going 25 times the speed of sound. The way we do that is. Those three engines on the back of the orbiter there, those are liquid engines. They're being fed liquid oxygen from the top of the tank, the pointy end, liquid hydrogen from the barrel section of the tank. They start about seven seconds before launch, and that gives them time to come up to full thrust. The computers check, check the, the engines, make sure they're working properly. If they are, then the, the space shuttle needs to launch itself, actually, the onboard computers would send a command that would simultaneously light the boosters and blow the eight explosive bolts that were holding us onto the launch pad. So those engines there would burn the entire um, eight and a half minutes, the eight and a half minute ride to orbit. Pretty interesting, I don't think eight and a half minutes to get to space. Yeah. But, but you are going really fast when you get there. <laughs> Um, initially, we're, we go pretty vertically, just trying to get out of the atmosphere. It's not straight up, but it's mostly mostly vertical. Uh, and then the boosters come off right about there, and then you can see the trajectory changes, and we actually would pitch over and just start paralleling the surface of the Earth. We're, we're out of the atmosphere at that point, uh, and we just need to accelerate. And so that's, that's why it changed there. Uh, once we get to, we got to the 20, we talked about it in feet per second, it's 26,000 feet per second, the speed we're going, more than five miles a second. Wouldn't that make your commute next? <laughs> um, the computer shut down the engines, uh, the liquid engines, uh, and a few seconds later we separated from the external tank, and that tank was, was the only part of the space shuttle program that wasn't reusable. And it would actually fly all the way around the world and re-enter the atmosphere over the Pacific Ocean and burn up uh, during, during entry. Here's what the station looked like when we got to it. It was uh, only three modules. There was uh, the center and the lower module. Those were built by the Russians. And the top piece there, that's the US built node. Uh, and it's, it has a docking port on the top there. It's got an attachment port here as well. So I docked to that port right there. The, um, 
the, the cylinder part of the node is a lot like the hub of a tinker toy set. So you can just, it has, every 90 degrees it has a, a port there, and so you can just keep building, with, attach something there. So we, we built the space station like a tinker toy. <laughs> That's the way, the way it works out. Uh, I mentioned the, the board days of spacewalks that the folks did after Koichi had the piece of them by um, This white section right there, that's an astronaut there, is, has his boots locked into uh, a foot restraint that's attached to the end of the arm. Uh, the other guy there, he's just hitchhiking there. And, and when they needed to go from one work site to another to get something done, Koichi would just fly him around with the arm, put them in place, and flop them from here to there. So, <laughs> Um, folks say, yeah, we get bored. I'll just float over the window and look at this incredibly beautiful planet that we have here. That we all, we all share. Um, so we're in this picture right here. This is the Galveston Bay. Oh. So the city of Houston's over here. There's the interstate going down to Galveston. Oh. But you can see things from space and from a couple hundred miles up. You see some of the features there. We're, right now, we're sitting right in here in Space Energy. You're in this picture. <laughs> Smile. Um, during launch, if you could look over your shoulder, you can see the peninsula of Florida uh, laying on its side there with the Florida Keys coming down this way. The island of Cuba is here. The Bahamas are just off the coast. Um, I love this picture of the eastern Mediterranean. And I guess we've got about 600 laps around the planet, so kind of know, you know, know the planet as well as we know our ride to work. <laughs> you know where all the potholes are and the speed traps. So uh, Eastern Med here, but and at the top, that shiny area, that's the Black Sea. So, so we're looking about a thousand miles. Uh, and, and when you look out any window from our out where we were at altitude, I see, see about, about a thousand miles, maybe a little more. Um, this mountainous area is Turkey, and there's Turkey, the island of Cyprus, right there. Um, down on the bottom is the Nile River Delta, which is a group that with enough water you can grow uh, things anywhere, including in the Sahara Desert, which is where this is. So um, down, the, down at the bottom, there's a little gray area right there. That's the city of Cairo. And just to the left of it is a little white area. That's where some of the pyramids are. Oh. And so the reason that you're seeing it looks white is because for a couple hundred years, tourists have been going down to look at the pyramids. And they walk around and they kick up the topsoil, and then the wind blows it away. Uh, and underneath, there's a white limestone uh, rock base there. So that's what we're, what we're seeing here. The uh, Suez Canal. On the right there. Um, there's a straight line right there. You don't see many geometric shapes in nature. So when you do see one, it kind of catches your attention. Uh, you know, like a, an impact crater uh, would be round and that would get, that would get your attention. But, uh, but that straight line right there, that's, the, that's a fence. That's the border between Egypt on the left and Israel on the right. The reason the colors are different is because the Israelis are irrigating and growing crops on their side and, and the Egyptians are not on their side. So this is the Dead Sea right there, the Sea of Galilee right there, and Jordan River we turn in between them. So one of our passes we went over and over again, I just happened to look out the window and looked out and I had this, this view here and I thought, wow, the whole Bible took place right there, right on one window. <laughs> kind of interesting. We see, see some natural phenomena. Um, here's a, a well-formed storm, a typhoon or, or a hurricane. Uh, you might get lucky and catch the, My God. the earth uh, erupting a volcano here. This is in Ooh. eastern Russia. My God. Pretty easy to tell which direction the wind's blowing. In <laughs> uh, the shuttle, we've got uh, flew for about two weeks and our limiting consumable in the, in the, in the, the entire uh, mission was the amount of oxygen that we had. So two weeks was about as long as we could go. Uh, so when it was time to come home, we would turn around and slow down, use a couple of small engines on the back, 
Uh, and we're traveling 26,000 feet per second, but uh, we only slow down about 400 feet per second. And that's enough to get us started from being in a circular orbit to start this very gradual, maybe one degree, one and a quarter degree uh, fall towards the top of the atmosphere. So we, we start at about 200 miles, and the top of the atmosphere is down here at about 63 miles. And so, so it, for the first half hour of the entry after you've done the, the orbit burn, you're still weightless. You're still here. Now, as you approach the top of the atmosphere, the, the air gets more, a little more dense, and you start, you know, the lower you go, the, um, the more dense the air is, and it would um, it would start to build a bow wave in front of the vehicle. So the bottom of the orbit is pretty flat. Uh, and it filled the bow wave, and that bow wave would get really hot because we're still, still going very, very fast. Uh, in fact, it gets to as hot as 3,000 degrees outside. So, on my first entry, you know, I've seen, I've seen been in the simulator a thousand times, but doing it for real the first time, I happened to notice that all of a sudden some burning campers were going past my window. I had a couple of thoughts for that. And my first thought was, wow, the simulator doesn't do this. <laughs> <laughs> and my second thought was, I hope that's not important. <laughs> so here's what it looks like from inside. I get you're literally surrounded by fire. And, and the, many people have seen Apollo 13, right, the movie? You know, the scene when the capsule's coming back in and they show it surrounded by fire for about five seconds or eight seconds or so during an entry. Um, you really are surrounded by fire, but it's, it's not five seconds, it's 20 minutes or so. <laughs> so, so it really gets your attention. Uh, in our case, the, our, I landed at, at uh, Edwards Air Force Base in California, um, not because they wanted us to, but because the weather in Florida never cooperated. It wasn't good enough for us to be able to, uh, to, to land there. So. Because you're just a big glider coming in, you don't have any engines. You really want, you don't have any other options either. You want the weather to be to be forecast to be really good, when, you know, when you when you get there. So I have a, a small video here, short video. It's of this mission, so you'll see some familiar people. Mm -hmm. First, as you'll see, the, the crew hatch come up here. That's um, we actually design our own hatches, where we try Where to try to capture what we're doing on the flight and the design of the hatch. That's why they're all look different when you, when you look at. Them. Wow! Uh, here we are heading out uh, on that about three and a half hours before launch. On what they said was our real launch day, we tried it about five times before we got it right for one, for one reason or another. Um, in fact, it took us so long to launch that my mother left. <laughs> <laughs> so here's, here's what it looks like. Uh, four of us are on the flight deck, and uh, the other three are downstairs right there. And the downstairs folks don't have a display. They don't have a window. They're just listening. So if you're upstairs, there are some things you can't say. You cannot say, uh-oh, <laughs> <laughs> or, or what was that, <laughs> because they will kill you later. <laughs> so here we are. This is a main engine start, you know, a few seconds, seven seconds before launch. You can see there, you can hear the roar, of course, and the vibration. There's the booster fighting. And as I mentioned, you know you're going somewhere. Um, we're going 100 miles an hour by the time we clear the tower. Uh, some of the Navy uh, fighter pilots have said it, it, to them it felt like they were, they were shot off a, a catapult off of an aircraft carrier. But it felt, they said it felt like a cat shot. So, so it, the space shuttle used to just leap into the air. At the two minute point, the boosters were off here and they'd fall back down into the ocean and we'd actually recover them. Uh, here's what it looks like inside. There's some small motors that fire to push the boosters away from us so they don't hit us. And we continue it on to orbit, and then um, right here, I reached over and I congratulated Pam. I shook her hand. If you remember, she was my rookie, and we were just passing 50 miles of altitude. So by definition, she had just become the planet's newest astronaut. <laughs> Here's the docking system. There, you can think of it as it's just right behind my window. 
But you can think of it as I have half of it on my side and the other half is on the space station side and my job is to bring the two halves together. So it took us two days to catch the, this um, space station. This view is, is looking up through my docking system, uh, a camera view up through my docking system. And that's the view that I relied on to bring the vehicles together. Here, I'm really, really glad that camera didn't break. <laughs> So here we are posting up to a point above there, this space, that, um, which is what this is, uh, for an hour. Uh, and because we needed to time the docking to happen as we were passing over a Russian ground site. So it was a very choreographed event. Um, and we knew how long it would take closing in at a certain rate from 170 feet. So here everybody has a different role to play. If you notice, uh, I'm looking across the cockpit. This is the station as we're sneaking up on it at about an inch per second. And my, I'm looking at a view, this view right here. My job is to keep that target centered. And if I do, then everything's going to come together correctly. Wow. So we had about five seconds to high five each other. <laughs> and then it was back to work. Here, Bill is operating the hardware to pull the vehicles together and then latch them so that we were, we've now created a tunnel that goes from our side on the space shuttle up to that hatch of the space station. So that we were the last crew to visit the space station before the first permanent crew was going to launch the next week. So, so when we got there, there wasn't anybody home, which was okay with us. <laughs> uh, here we are up, up at the hatch to the Station, looking inside the node, the U.S. built node, and here's LIA as he, you can see, that's a 400 pound hatch and he's moving it with his two fingers up there, I think really are weightless up there, and he started to float into the, to the station, then he backed up and goes, no, Brian, you're the commander, you go in. I thought, wow, what a nice guy. <laughs> it was only later I learned that he was using me as the canary in the coal mine. <laughs> <laughs> So the first crew is going to launch the next week after, after um, we were done. And the flight surgeons here wanted to know what was in the air inside of the space station because the crew is going to be there for six months and they're going to be breathing it. So, so the very first thing we did was take an air sample. That's not a hand grenade. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's the air sample model. They floated it in and I took it on the far end uh, of the node, took the sample. We brought that home, and that way they could analyze it and know what kind of gases are in the inside that the crew is going to be breathing. This is a little cartoon of Koichi's robotic arm work, lifting the pieces and putting them in place. This is our major payload right here. It's called the Z1 truss, and, and it's named that because it's go, it was the first piece to go in the Z axis of the space station, if you think of it as X, Y, Z. And while we're training, they said, well, we, we realize you're going to be really busy, but would you mind making a movie? <laughs> so they actually taught us how to be movie producers. That was an IMAX camera that I had there. We were shooting a scene that's in an IMAX uh, 3D movie called Space Station. Space Station 3D. Here's Pam changing the film out. And the cool thing that the spacewalkers got to do was to test, test fly a self-rescue jetpack. So in the past, when, whenever we did spacewalks, if somebody's tether became disconnected and they started floating away from the shuttle, I could always just fly the shuttle over and rescue them. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, they really wanted to be able to rescue themselves. <laughs> and so, so here you can see, this is uh, LA, he's coming right towards the camera. You can see he's, he's very much in control. Um, would have no difficulty at all being able to fly himself back to the space station. He has a, he has a controller on his chest there, Velcro to his chest. You can see his trajectory change as he puts in a couple of inputs. He decided he didn't really want to hit the camera that was filming that. And then after the four days of spacewalks, we had one more day that we were going to remain docked with the space station. And we use that day here as we're floating into the Russian segment. 
We use that data to push across bags of supplies, all of these white bags that you see Velcroed on the floor and the ceiling and the walls. Those were bags of uh, food and clothing and water, and, uh, tools and experiments, things that the people were going to need permanently on the space station. Uh, and then we got ready to undock. But we treat the space station as if it's a naval vessel. It actually has a ship's bell on it. And uh, there's a, naval, a Navy protocol that uh, they were, when the visiting vehicle is going to depart, you ring the bell a couple of times to uh, announce the departure. So that's what we were doing. I had to be in an airplane. And here you see us separating. Now, uh, during the two and a half years of training, it became very obvious to me that Pam Melroy was going to be a future space shuttle commander. In fact, she became the second woman commander of the space shuttle. So that what that meant was the next time she went to the space station, she would be doing the flying. So to give her some hands-on experience, I had her fly the undocking uh, in the back away, uh, just so she'd know how the vehicle was going to react the next time when she's when she's the commander. They always got a police radar gun there. We were, we were supposed to separate at, at a certain rate away from the space station. But. See how bright it is up there? You know, there's no atmosphere to diffuse the sunlight, so it's, it's extremely bright. And as we backed away from it, looking, looked at it, we got you know kind of mixed feelings. It was, it was bittersweet because we were happy that we were 100% successful, everything had gone well, uh, but a little sad because you know the the mission was coming to an end, and our little family was going to end up breaking up and going our own different ways. So, so natural thing. But so here, Pam getting some exercise and getting ready to come back. I just chose to exercise differently. <laughs> 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 Here's Queen to get a drink of water. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a baseball on board that oh my God. went to the Japanese Little League when, when after landing. But we didn't have a bat, so we had to use a hammer. <laughs> 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 that was tough. Yeah, you fouled it off, but at least you didn't miss it. <laughs> and then here's a random reward. Uh. <laughs> well, on the, the third extra day, we knew we were coming home. Florida was still down. So they said, we're going to bring you into California, into Edwards. And, you know, no, no big deal for us because uh, I lived at Edwards for a year going to test pilot school. My daughter was born up there, in fact. And we did some training out there during the, during the year. So here we are doing it. We did the year of a beautiful day in California, not a cloud in the sky. Came across uh, Edwards, or, or LA, at 100,000 feet, still going Mach 5. Uh, <laughs> And rolled out on final, and in a 20 degree dive, and there's a black rectangle that boils in the lake bed. It's about a mile short of the runway. So we're in a 20 degree dive going 300 knots at 2,000 feet, which is right there. I, I pulled the start the nose up, so I'm going from a 20 degree dive just to a more conventional one and a half degree in glide slope like an airliner. Pam and I are working together as a team, and she puts the gear down at 400 feet right there. And then she starts calling out altitudes and airspeeds. And there's a certain cadence that I'm looking for. I want to hear 50, 250, 40, 240, 30, 230, 20, 20, 10, 10, 10, touch. And we're calling out at 200 knots. If I'm off of that cadence, I have to put an adjustment in real quickly. Because it happens at about that pace. We're slowing down at a rate of five knots per second just because of the drag of the vehicle. Uh, flew the nose wheel down, Pam had the drag shoot out. The drag shoot's very effective, but I hardly even touched the wheel brakes to stop us. And then after a couple hours, we uh, had the vehicle powered down. That's Discovery in the background, you see there, and have a chance to 
you know, go look at the most incredible flying machine ever ever built by humans. Beautiful. It was absolutely amazing what the space shuttle could do. Um, you know, it was a 30-year program. We flew 135 missions. Uh, and in my mind, the two biggest uh, accomplishments, the two biggest accomplishments were the uh, deployment and then the continual upgrade of the, of the Hubble Space Telescope. Because that has changed the way we think of our place in the universe. It's rewritten the science books. Uh, and also, the other one is the, the 37 missions that it took to assemble, to sleep the assembly of the International Space Station. Uh, finished doing that. Because when I look at the space station now, it, yes, it's a laboratory that's open, that's open you know, 24 7, and we can do all kinds of interesting things there. But, um, but I look at it as the very first step to Mars. Because we're using the space station to learn the things that we need to before we can commit to send a human on that six month voyage one way. To go to Mars. So, so it was an amazing program. Uh, NASA is not out of business. In fact, they're building a new rocket and the new Orion. You can see some of the models here that are here and that are probably going to be the, the way we get to space for the next 50 years. So, so we're working on your rocket right now <laughs> for the Mars generation. And it's uh, coming along well, and you should, within two years, we should see our first test flight. So yeah. once the smoke and fire, is, you know, happens, then we'll be back on the news again. <laughs> uh, and, and looking forward to a, a very bright future for uh, human space exploration. So I hope, thanks again for coming today, and, and I hope you enjoy the day. Yeah. There's so much to see and do here. And, and one last time, thanks for bringing the, the students as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir.